Well, it's more than that, but first I'd like to thank uh, USA Basketball Women's National Team Director, Carol Callen, who is with us somewhere. Carol and her husband Dave uh, for facilitating uh, they have a long friendship, uh, Carol, through USA ba Basketball with Tamika. They're facilitating uh, having such an uh, honored guest to speak with us today. Um, and also our uh, leadership development, career development program, which is supported by the Scripps family uh, for supporting uh, Tamika's trip and presentation today. Um, I'd like to tell you, just, I have 10 pages on Tamika, so I, I, it, it's just remarkable what she's achieved in her, in, the short, in her short lifetime. In high school, in both Illinois and Duncanville, Texas, she was part of three state championship teams. She has been a champion wherever she's gone in the sport of basketball. She recorded, a, I have to say this, a quintuple double. I've never heard of a quintuple that's in five categories like assist block shots. Quintuple at the high school level as a senior. She was named Illinois Miss Basketball. She was the 1997 Naismith and WBCA National Prep Player of the Year and a four-time Parade Magazine All-America. That was just high school. Then she signed at Tennessee to play for legendary coach Pat Summit at the University of Tennessee. They went on to go 134 in 10 in four years. 10 in four years, 10 losses. I mean, 134 is remarkable. They won four regular season SEC titles and three tournament titles. So out of eight opportunities to win a championship, they won seven of them when, when she made the play. Uh, they won the national championship in 98. She was the consensus, consensus I, I'm better learn how to say that because she was consensus in everything that she did. That means everybody voted for her. Uh, National Player of the Year in 2000. She was a four-time, once again, four-time first team Kodak All-American while she was at team, uh, Tennessee and won the ESPY Award as the Collegiate Women Player of the Year in, in 2001. So then she goes on to play pro, drafted uh, by the Indiana Fever in 2001. I love this, Tamika. Defensive Player of the Year in the WNBA five times. Uh, WNBA All-Star 12 times. She only played 14 years, and one of them she was injured. She was an All-Star 12 times. Um, she was the league MVP. She was a member of the WNBA All-Decade team, and won, also won the WNBA championship with the Fever. Now on to the Olympics. She went on to play for USA Basketball. First opportunity was the Jones Cup introductory gold medal. Competed on four, four Olympic Games and won gold medal at every single Olympic Games uh, that she competed in. There are only five athletes in the world with four Olympic gold medals, and Tamika is one of them. She won two world championships. Her tenure with USA Basketball in major international events was 58 in one. But uh, I was fortunate enough to spend a little time with Tamika last night, and it's who she is as a human being and who she is as a person that really makes it special to have her visit us today. In 2015, she was ESPN Sports Humanitarian of the Year Award, co-recipient of the 2016 National Civil Rights Museum Sports Leg Legacy Award, she created her own foundation, Catch the Stars Foundation, to help at-risk youth. She won the 2008 Don Staley Community Leadership Award. And tomorrow night, you could catch her on the SEC Network, where she will be color analyst on the Tennessee uh, Texas a and game. So she's a color analyst. She hasn't stopped since she retired in 2016, right? She hasn't stopped. She owns her own tea shop, if you make it to Indianapolis, the Tease Me Cafe. Uh, but she has a real job. I said, well, okay, wait a minute. You're an analyst. You own a tea shop. She goes, that's not my job. That's not my job. What's your job? Her job is Director of Player Programs and Franchise Development. I could go on and on and on. I know you're here to listen to Tamika. It is a great honor to welcome you to Boulder and the University of Colorado.
Tamika. 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 I was three years old, and I was sitting on the playground building the coolest sand castle. <laughs> and my dad was standing behind me, and he was saying, Tamika. 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 Well, like most parents, he thought one of two things. Either one, I was ignoring him, or two, that I couldn't hear him. Dad's older brother came out, and they had gone through testing and found out that he had a hearing disability. And then I had an older sister, Tasha. I always say she's the perfect one. Because everything about her is perfect. And then there's me, the baby. So just like my brother came out, my mom and dad took me through testing. And I found out that I was born with a hearing disability. The youngest of three, the baby, a girl. What type of life would I live? Well, of course, for me, at three years old, I had no idea what that meant. The worst part of it all was that when I had to go through the testing, they put me in this box all by myself to test my youth. Well, a couple years after that, they gave me the big brown box hearing aid. And so everywhere I went, everybody knew that I had a hearing disability. But honestly, I had, still had no idea what it really meant. My father played in the NBA for 11 years, played for the Milwaukee Bucks, New Jersey, and Philadelphia 76ers, and the Los Angeles Clippers. So when people ask me, like, where are you from? I'm like, well, you want my whole life story. <laughs> I play in Chicago some days and Dallas other days, and then I say, <clears throat> I was born in New Jersey, and that totally throws everything off. <laughs> but we moved around a lot, and when my dad got finished playing here in America, we moved overseas to Italy for a year. I was in first grade. I say my first grade year was the first time, or the, or the last time, that I realized that I was different, or that I didn't realize I was different. You see, in second grade, we moved back to Abilene, Texas. And every single day, I remember going to school. And every single day, when I'd walk through those doors, I would get made fun of. For the way that I looked, for the way that I talked, for the hearing aids that I wore, and just frankly for being different. And it was crazy because we all know that Italy is a part of the world. But you can imagine, second graders, they kind of thought we were from like out of space, and they had no idea that Italy was a part of the US, or a part of the world, the globe. And so every day I would walk in, and every single day, I remember walking home. My brother and my sister would be in front, and I would be behind, and I would have tears streaming down my face. And I would walk in the door at home, and I would slam the door as hard as I could. And I would literally beg my mom, please, Please don't make me go back. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll wash dishes, I'll fold clothes for the rest of my life. <laughs> Just don't make me go back. And every day my mom would wipe my tears away. And she would say, honey, I can't let you give up. Every single day. Well, I remember one day I woke up, probably about halfway through second grade, and I woke up and I had this mantra. Today's going to be a good day. Today's going to be a good day. Today's going to be a good day. I brushed my teeth. Today's going to be a good day. I got ready. We had breakfast. Today's going to be a good day. We walked to school. Today's going to be a good day. And as soon as I walked through the door, I got made fun of. And my head dropped. My shoulders drooped. And once again, I tried to be as invisible as I could possibly be. But everywhere I went, the same you. My ears, the way I talk, being different, getting pulled out of class to go to speech therapy. It just kept coming every which way. Today was supposed to be a good day. And so as we left school that day, and my brother and my sister were in front of me, and I still had the tears coming down my face, and I remember saying, today was supposed to be a good day. And as we walked by this tall field of grass, I stopped, and I took one hearing aid out, and I took the other hearing aid out, and I turned to the field. 
and I threw them as far as I possibly could. But we always had a routine when we got home. We'd come home, we'd do our homework, then we would have snack, the most important part of the snack. <laughs> and then after the snack, we would go and do whatever sports we were a part of. One of the softball teams. Got any softball players here? It was softball season. So we got home, we did our homework, we ate our snack, and my mom put us in the car. My sister and I played on the same team when we went to the field. Well, one thing about me that a lot of people, well, you probably know from field, is I hate to be put in a box. I don't like to be contained into one area. So my softball coach put me in left field. Well, they really figured out, they figured out really soon I played left field, center field, and right field at the same time. <laughs> so what did he do? He put me at catcher. But even when he put me at catcher, I was also one of those tomboys, but I had to make everything look good. So even though I was a catcher, I was kind of moved to the side, but I could swoop in <laughs> and make it look good. Well, after practice, my mom was looking at me. There's something different about me. And she just, and you know how mom, we got mom, young yeah, lady, why are you hearing that? I don't know. And so we went to left field and center field and right field and first base and second base and third base and to the pitcher's mound and to the home plate. And we lifted, we're lifting bases, we're looking everywhere, guess what? We didn't find them. So my mom put us in the car, we get back home, and I'm like, yes, it's time for dinner. No, it's not. We're going to walk to school, and we're going to find your sin. So we walk to school, and we walk back home, and we walk back to school, and we walk back home, and we never found no sin. And my mom sat me down at the kitchen table, and she says, honey, your father and I cannot afford to buy you hearing aids by you new hearing because you lost them. You're going to have to learn how to live without them. And I looked at her with those big puppy dog eyes. And when I turned around, <laughs> today is going to be a good day. But well, what I soon realized was that the things that I had that my parents had provided for me, hearing were not just some objects that I had to wear, but they were my way of being able to operate in the world. Because without them, even though I could hear, my brain had to operate probably a hundred times more without them. But I learned how to do four things really, really fast. The first thing I learned how to do was read lips. And I always tell the kids this because, like, I may not be able to hear you, but I can read your lips. So all the kids are like, <laughs> So the first thing I did was I learned how to read lips. The second thing I did, I sat in the front row of every single one of my classes. The third thing I did, I would literally, and this is the second grade, I would literally read the textbook. I would read chapters of each one of my classes, each one of the textbooks for my classes. Because I figured that something that I read the teacher had to go. And then the fourth thing, I would sit in the front, or I would go up to my teachers after every single class. Because one thing, when I was writing my notes and the teacher was talking, as long as the teacher was looking at me, I was fine. But you remember those chalkboards we used to have that we don't have anymore? Whenever the teacher turned to write on the board and when they were talking, I couldn't hear them. I couldn't read their lips. And so I would have to stay after class every single day to get my notes filled in, every single class. Well, literally, I operated my life and that was just the beginning. Whenever I get a chance to speak and go out, and you know, I like this because I want to, this is more of a conversation. That's the beginning of my life. But when I think about being here and as I started thinking about what I wanted to talk about, I thought about the box, the being on the softball field and how coach tried to contain me to my left field and to my catcher and how I always have tried to live outside my box. For each one of us in this room, there's a box and there's something in some area that we've automatically been put in. African-American, woman, 
hearing impediment, speech impediment, and on and on and on, and each one of us has them. But today, we're going to think about, or we're going to talk about, think outside the box. What are we talking about? <coughs> We're gonna try that again. <laughs> give you guys another chance. I'm not a coach by any means, but I, I'm, I'm gonna help you out. So today we're gonna to talk about thinking outside the box. Okay? What are we talking about? Thinking outside the box. Thank you. So I love acronyms, and we're gonna use the acronym for the box. Okay? You ready for this? Are you ready? <laughs> Thank you. The B. Believe. Believe. I was in seventh grade every day. And during the summertime, I was up about 7 o'clock. I was out of the house by 7.30. Got to the basketball court, all the guys. I, I'm sorry, I know we had this amazing panel. I did not play with girls. I only played with boys. But they would wait for me at the basketball court. And we didn't start playing basketball until I got there at 7.45. And we would play all day. And at lunchtime, my mom would bring lunch, a little picnic basket. And we would set up at half court and we would sit there and talk about that for all day. And then when we were done, we put it to the side and we would play until the late, until it was dark and we had to be at home every single day. Because my goal was to be in the NBA, the week. And I'm proud of who I am. Because the boxes, not that they've all gone away, they're all still around. But I made a choice. And even in this box, I made a choice to step outside of it. And I think that's what each one of us needs to do. I watched the video a couple of years ago, and it had, it was, a, um, it was an overseas video. And the guy that was, the narrator was asking a whole bunch of questions. All these people were in the room. So let's try it, okay? I've never done this, but we're going to try it. Okay, Jill. I'm the assistant director of Fitness and Recreation. Oh, nice. Thank you, Jill. You're welcome. Nice to meet you. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I like your shirt. Oh, thank you. Do you work here? Oh, I actually work here. Yeah, yeah, I thought I was going to have to. Like, I didn't know that. Can you do it on the way? Yeah, you do it on the way. Take a picture. Take a picture. Right there. Indy, then? Quick announcement. We have the career fair also going on in studio four. One oh. Okay. Me too. Dave Me too. Me too. Me too. Me too. Me I'm like, I won't be there. There's rain, there's snow coming. You never know. You never know what you're going to get. It's awesome. I'm going to Indy. Appreciate your words today. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Sure. Planning committee for this event. Oh, cool. So I'm super excited to, yeah. to have you aboard and joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, that was fantastic. Thank you. I love Robert Hugh Hill with Carol and Dave. That always is. Uh huh. Tamika, thank you so much. I'm Nicole. I would love for you to I get it, because you're out to another one, right? Yeah, we're going to go. No, So everybody's like, Awesome. Okay. Please do. Yeah, please do. Yeah, we'll catch up. I'm glad. It's always good to meet people. Yeah, I'm in the community. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Maybe one of these. Maybe Mel's actually. One of these has to come out, right? 
Yes, thanks, Sadie. Thank you. 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 Oh, Josh. 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 Oh,